This episode of Science Max is all about earthquakes. Exciting. How do we build something that won't fall apart when shaken? Plus a lot of other ways to shake things or build things. Science! All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be looking at earthquakes. Earthquakes! Huh. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something. <laughs> that was supposed to happen earlier. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. Earthquakes happen when two plates on the Earth's surface rub together, and it causes the ground to shake. It causes the ground to shake. Sometimes it shakes a little, sometimes it shakes a lot. Chances are you do not live in a place that has earthquakes. But if you do, ask an adult what to do during an earthquake so you can be safe. Modern buildings that are built in earthquake zones are designed to withstand the shaking. But how do scientists and engineers build a building that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. First thing we have to do is simulate an earthquake. We're going to build a shaker table. And here's what you need. Two books and... Oh. 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 <sighs> Two books. Four elastic bands and four, four rubber balls. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> four, four rubber balls. All right. So the first thing you do is actually take your four elastic bands and wrap them around your books. Put one set on one side, one set on the other side, until you have that. Then you take your four balls and you stick them in between the books, in the middle-ish area, but you don't want to have them too close to the edges. And now two at the back, and ta-da! You've made your own shaker table. What are you shaking, you ask? I will show you. You build a tower, like this one here that I built out of building blocks. So here's what you do. You'll need your base to be securely attached to the shaker table. I use painter's tape because it'll come off again without harming the books. And what I want to find out is just how much shaking this tower can take before it falls apart. Ready? Oh. And there it goes. And when you've done that, what you do is you be a science maximite and you design another tower. And you tape it down to your shaker table and see if you can make this tower fall down in an earthquake. And if you built it really well, it probably won't. <laughs> But you don't have to just use building blocks. There's all kinds of other materials you can use. Check out this building, which is really tall. And you'll see there's a cup at the top. And that's for a baseball. Hmm. Put it up at the top. And that means there's a weight up there. And then we shake it. And we see what happens. Oh, oh no. Oh, there it goes. So that is what we're going to be doing today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're going to be making a giant shaker table and putting a giant structure on top and seeing how we design it to make sure it stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. I'm going to need an expert to help me, though. Um, oh, I know. Anne would be really good at this. OK, all I need to do is get Anne, and we can start. Oh, come on. There it is. All right. Hey, Anne, I... Huh? I feel weird. Why do I feel weird? I think you're a chair. Well, that's not good. Oh, hold on a second. Am I... Am I good? Okay. Hi, Anne. Good to see you. Here's your lab coat. Thank you. So you're from Let's Talk Science, right? I am. All about science education, just like us. Today, I need your help to max out our earthquake table. This is the table this looks part, great. obviously, but this is a tower I've made out of popsicle sticks. Yeah. So in order to max it out, I've already built a large shaker table. Come on. This is my large shaker table. So it's got basketballs underneath as the four balls, but it works exactly the same. Whoa. Whoa. 
<laughs> okay, so what kind of tower should we make for the shaker table? If we want something tall, then we'll reinforce it a couple spots. But the true test, it's got to have some sort of weight on top so that it will mimic the weight that would be on a real tower. Right, so maybe I could get a plastic bin and I'll just put some sandbags for weight inside. That would be perfect. And then balls so that when it falls over, the balls will go everywhere. That would be perfect. Okay, great. We shake off. I don't know. I think we should just get off. Another thing that happens during an earthquake is soil liquefaction. Liquefaction means something turns to liquid. In this case, the very ground you might be standing on. Here's how you can experiment with soil liquefaction. All you need is a plastic container and some water, not very much, barely enough to cover the bottom of the container because what you're gonna put in next is sand. And you wanna put it in there and spread it around. Just add enough sand so it just starts to turn dry on the very last layer. So here is a house that I'm going to put on top. And now I will simulate an earthquake. The water rises up and it sort of turns to liquid, soil liquefaction. And heavy things like houses and cars, they tend to sink like that. And then the soil rehardens and everybody's houses are stuck in the mud. Now, let's max it out. This is a giant tub of sand and water, and this is a vibrating platform that will simulate an earthquake. Now, as you can see, this sand is totally solid. I can jump all around on this sand, no problem. But when I turn on the vibrating table and simulate an earthquake, things will change. The vibrations bring the water below the sand to the surface and cause the sand particles to separate. What was solid now turns to liquid in my simulated earthquake, and I start to sink. I'm up to my shins! And there you go! Soil liquefaction! Hey, look at that! It's totally solid! <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo! Soil liquefaction! I am totally... Uh-oh. You know what I realized? When it stops vibrating, it really becomes solid again. And it's very tough to... Well, there, there you go. Soil liquefaction. I'm, uh... I'm really kind of stuck in here. I... So Anne and I have made a large shaker table. Now it's just a matter of designing a building. We use lumber and cut it up, use screws to attach it all together, put a platform on top for a weight, and attach it securely to our shaker table. The building is super simple. Just four corners and a few planks around the outside. No structure in the middle. And finally, the big heavy weight on the top. There. We attach a pole to the shaker table so we can shake from a safe distance and try it out. Okay, very slow. Forward. Let's see how much shaking it can stand with our shakeometer. Okay. That seems to be okay. Kidding. Oh, oh no. Oh no! We barely start to shake our tower before it collapses. Oh, that didn't really last very long, did it? It completely folded up on itself. Uh, what do we do to fix this, make it better? I think the easiest thing we can do is to use thicker wood. It'll make it less wobbly. Okay, sure, let's make another one. High fives. We do have lots of wood, that's a good thing. Anne and I are trying small improvements every time. There. Our last building used thinner pieces of wood. Now we're using thicker wood, which we think will help keep the weight at the top from collapsing the building. Everything else about the design of our building is the same. We put the weight on top and fix our pole and we're good to go. All right, you ready? Problem. Okay. Starting to creak, but it recovers. You can yeah. see it lean, and then it comes back, and it, re and it resets. Definitely doing better than the last one. Oh, no. I'm impressed. Oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh -oh. here oh. we go. Oh. <laughs> It definitely did better than the first one. It did better than the first one. And the thicker wood definitely helped. But it was really starting to turn. I think on the next one, we need some platforms in the center to help strengthen it even more. Earthquake Building 3.0.
yeah. thicker wood this time, but with platforms in the middle. So we're gonna see how well this version works with these middle parts that'll hopefully reinforce. And they're just like the floors of a building. Okay, well let's find out if it's gonna make any difference. Start the wall a little, but it looks pretty good. As soon as we start shaking, it's really obvious this building is more solid. Uh-oh, it's starting to creak. Oh, it's really starting to creak. The platforms in the middle really seem to improve the structure. You can see it bend all the way over and still recover. But still, it wasn't long before... Really starting to lean. <laughs> wow, the extra pieces really kind of made it more impressive. It definitely lasted a lot longer than the other two. It did, but here's what I'm wondering. Are we going in the wrong direction? What do you mean? Well, because if it's really solid, it resists the change. Okay, I see where you're going with this. So if we make it flexible, it can resist the shaking of an earthquake. I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Busta Bika, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. My tuna fish and meatball sub soup is coming along quite nicely, but what will we have for dessert? I know. How about earthquake buildings? Ha <laughs> ha! It's a building made out of wafer cookies, but the people on Vanilla Street built in the gelatin neighborhood, and the people on Chocolate Street built in the crispy rice part of town. Exciting. Now, here comes the earthquake. Oh, no! Oh, it's shaking! Oh, the shaking has come and gone for the people on Chocolate Avenue, and their building is still standing. Now, let's take a look over here on Vanilla Street, and here comes an earthquake. Oh, no! Oh, dear! Looks like the people on Vanilla Street are going to have to rebuild their building because it's all fallen over and being eaten. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Buildings can be built the same way, but the kind of soil they sit on make a large difference if there's an earthquake. Shaky, wiggly soil or solid, non-moving soil. So there you go. An experiment you can try at home. Delicious. Well, I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Cooking with Science. Mm, now to try my soup. Size barometer in 60 seconds. Learning how to predict and measure earthquakes is an important branch of science. The Earth is shaking, but which way did the earthquake come from? It's all about measuring the vibrations, and to do that, you need a seismometer. All you need is a ball, some paper cups, some modeling clay, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same thing as invisible tape, except I use this tape for science. First, take your pencil and stick it straight down into the modeling clay. Then, you take your cups and you arrange them in a circle and tape the cups down. And that goes right in the middle, just like that. Now, what you do is you take the ball and you carefully balance it on the pencil. Now you have created a seismometer. It will tell you what direction an earthquake came from. Watch, I will be the earthquake. Ready? Did you see that? The ball fell into the cup facing the direction that I hit the table. And now I'm gonna hit the table from over here. Yep, it fell in the direction that I hit the table. Okay, let's try from over here. There you go, your very own seismometer that you can use to measure earthquakes that you create on the table. Back to our earthquake building. Ann and I tried a few different designs and they each got a little better. But now we're wondering what would happen if we built the tower out of very flexible material. We used some plastic tubing and attached the wood with bungee cords, which are like big elastics. Wow, okay, so looks good. So let's test it. Okay. And sure enough, when we start shaking it, the tower holds up to as much shaking as we can give it. Wait. What? Aren't we missing something? Oh. Yeah, we're missing the weight at the top. Of course. So I think we need to try it again. So we add the weight to the top, and then everything changes. Oh, oh no. Look at it twist. Oh, dear. It's twisted. A flexible go. tower is great until you try to put a weight at the top. And then it just seems <laughs> really unstable. Oh, no. oh, there it goes. Oh. 
<laughs> Look at that. It's totally bent. It didn't break at all. It just fell over. Yeah, it couldn't even support the weight. So it was almost too flexible. So I guess we should go back to a more rigid design. Mm -hmm. But what if we change the shape a little bit? Because mm -hmm. you know what I was thinking. This is a very stable shape. Mm -hmm. Triangle, because triangles are really strong. What about um, we, we make an X? Like a triangle within a triangle. Triangle, and then triangle. So that really reinforces all of the shaking, like all the motion. We'll never know until we try. All right. Uh-oh, I have all my friends coming over and I don't have a table. But that's okay, I will make a table using my friends. This is an awesome experiment you can do with four friends. Come on in, science friends. I've got Sam and Dylan and Polly here to help me. So everybody turn to your left and sit sideways on the chair and then scooch the chairs into the middle. And then everybody leans back onto the knees of the other person. And then, this is why I said you need four friends, because you need the fifth person to remove the chairs! Oh. The reason why this works is because everybody's weight is being supported on the legs of the person next to them. Okay, we're gonna rotate in a circle, everybody. Okay, ready? Here we go, rotating, rotating. Oh, oh, science table. Ooh, hey, we're pretty good at this. Okay. Uh oh. Oh no, oh no! <laughs> so there you go. Awesome way to make a table using your friends. Well done. Well done. Science. Here's an experiment you can do to impress the adults in your house. You need three glasses, all of equal height, and three knives, not sharp knives, the dull knives you use, maybe the ones you use at dinner time. Take your three knives and put them in a triangle, all equally spaced out. Then move the knives together to make a little triangle, all right, like that. Then what you wanna do is you wanna carefully arrange the knives so each knife is going above one knife and below another knife. So there we go. Then you wanna take this careful pattern that you created and you wanna put it on top of your three glasses. One, where each handle of the knives are gonna be. And if you place it carefully, and you've done the over-unders correctly, it will stay up. Pretty amazing, the knives support their own weight. But they don't just support their own weight, they can support a lot more weight too. Pretty amazing, right? This is a great experiment. It's also something really interesting that we can max out. Come on. And here you go, the maxed out knife balance. I've got three pieces of lumber and three barrels, and as you can see, the pattern is exactly the same. Under, over, under, over, under, over. Ha ha. So, the question is, how much faith do I have in science? Ah, it totally supports my weight. I know it's going to work because I know that a two by four, which is the kind of lumber I'm using, can hold up my weight. So that means the structure can support me. <laughs> Science! You know what the cool thing is? The cool thing is that even though it's holding me up, each one of these pieces of wood is only up because it's supported by the others. You pull one out and it all falls apart. Ann and I have tried solid towers and flexible towers, and nothing has worked fantastically yet with a big weight on the top. Having a big weight on the top of our tower means we need something that will resist the movement of that weight. So now we're going to start with a triangle. Unlike a rectangle, triangles are very stable. A wider base keeps the structure from swaying too much. And cross braces in the middle mean that there are other triangles within our triangle, all the better to resist movement. Thank you. After Ann and I built our tower, we added the weight to the top, secured it to the base, and tried it out. Okay, here we go. Ooh. It's looking good. No problem. It's not twisting. It's, it's not, not even leaning. Not even creaking. No, it looks really good. Wow, this one is really solid. 
As you can see, this tower is way more solid than our square tower or the flexible tower. Okay, look at that. Like, if that's not an earthquake, I don't know what is. Look at that. Look at the way the ground is moving. I don't know if we can shake it much more than this. Faster. Our triangular tower is up past a level of shaking that made the other towers collapse. Now it's time to max out the shaking. There's only one level of shaking that we can do above this. What's that? We shake from either side. We give it all we have. The floor was bouncing from side to side, the tower was tilting and was totally solid. It's still holding strong. In fact, Anne and I wore out before the building showed any signs of falling over. I think we've done it. Woo! Nice yeah. job. Nice. <laughs> Science Max experiments at large earthquake proof building. I mean, come on. That was impressive. I like it. On this episode of Science Max, I'm on a quest to harness the power of lightning. Its balloon sticking, hoop levitating, hair raising power is all thanks to static electricity. Hold on to your grounding rods. <laughs> There's electricity in the air. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be harnessing the awesome power of lightning! <laughs> How are we harnessing the power of lightning, you ask? With this balloon. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, what's similar between a balloon and lightning? Well, nothing right now. But behold, as I use the power of static electricity and rub the balloon on my head. Because basically, that's how it starts. You see, when I rub this balloon on my head, it's stealing electrons from me creating a positive charge in my hair and a negative charge in the balloon. And the interesting thing is, you know that things with opposite charges attract each other, right? Something that has a positive charge will attract negative things and vice versa. But anything with a charge will attract anything with a neutral charge. See all these things on the table? They all have a neutral charge, which means they've got equal amounts of positive and negative. Right now, this balloon is building up a big negative charge, which means it will be attracted to all of these things. This can of Science Max Soda, it has a neutral charge. The balloon has a negative charge, which means the can will be attracted to the balloon. And this paper is neutrally charged, which means the paper will be attracted to the balloon. And if you hold the negatively charged balloon next to neutrally charged sugar, ha ha, sugar storm. And you probably, wait, I don't want to get sugar in my hair. And you probably know this trick. If you rub a balloon on your head, you can stick it on the wall. Ha ha! But what does any of this have to do with lightning? Well, the same thing is going on with a lightning bolt. The clouds become negatively charged, and that negative charge wants to equalize itself with the ground, which is neutrally charged. And that lightning bolt is the electricity jumping from one place to another. And you can see this yourself. If you rub a balloon on your head and you put it next to something metal, like a doorknob, there'll be a spark. But here's another thing you can do if you don't have a balloon, which I guess I don't anymore. Rub your feet, if you're wearing socks, on a carpet, and then turn out all the lights and touch a doorknob. You might be able to see a spark jump from your finger to the door. That's lightning in a very, very small form. So that's what we want to do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Max out lightning! I think I'm going to go to the Ontario Science Center and ask Heather her advice. She really knows her stuff. I'm going to go see if she's busy right now. Come on. Well, I you just... got the portal fixed. So... Well, it's not exactly fixed. It's. Still got a couple 
bugs that I'm ironing out, but I stopped coming in 10 feet above the floor. Hey. So that's a, a step yeah. in the right direction. Anyway, Heather, <laughs> I've come here because I want to ask your advice on something. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So what I am doing is creating lightning. So this is where I'm at right now. So this is a balloon. I blow up the balloon and then I rub it on my head and it creates a static charge, right? right? Yeah. Just like in the lightning bolt between the clouds and the ground. And the ground. So I was wondering if I was wondering if you could help me maybe max that out and I thought the perfect place to start would be a larger balloon. Ooh, right on. Actually, yeah, I like this. Yeah. Um, I've got a big balloon if you just give me a second. Sure. All right, catch. Okay. All right, giant balloon. So, what I figured is I'll just start rubbing it on my head. Okay. And then we could maybe stick it to the wall or something? Yeah. I think instead of a wall, we can even try on this, this whiteboard here. Oh, okay, great. Keep rubbing. I'm, I'm right. rubbing. Okay, right, ready? Yeah. Here we go. Try. And... So that, um, that didn't, didn't exactly right. work. Yeah. Both of us rubbing our heads on the balloon. Okay. And... Go! Wow, that was a whole lot of nothing. Well, we've got a really heavy balloon here. And so. I feel like our heads are only this big, so we can't cover as much surface area of the balloon. Fortunately, you can also build up a static charge by rubbing a balloon on a sweater. Or if your balloon is giant, rubbing sweaters on your balloon. Yeah. But even that didn't work so well. I think what we need to do is come up with a better way to create a difference of charge. Yeah, yeah, let's forget about the balloon. You have something else? I have something else. Really awesome here at the Science Center. You wanna check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all right. Should we take the sweater and the balloons, or um, should we leave them here? We'll leave them here. Okay. Yes. So here's how static electricity works. Normally, everything has equal numbers of positive and negative charges. That's when things are said to have a neutral charge. But when you rub a balloon on your head, the balloon develops more negative charge than positive because it pulls electrons from your hair. The same thing happens in clouds during a storm. The cloud develops a negative charge when water molecules start bumping into each other. A lightning bolt happens when the negative charge in the cloud gets so big, the attraction to the positive charge in the ground gets strong enough that the electrons can make the jump all the way from the cloud to the ground, and you get lightning. <laughs> Heather and I tried to max out the static on a balloon, but a big heavy balloon just doesn't hold the same charge. That didn't, didn't exactly right, work. Yeah. But we're only interested in maxing out the static charge, and Heather knows just what to use. Wow. So this is the Ontario Science Centre yes. electricity show. Yes. Okay, so where's the electricity part? The one we're gonna be playing with is right there. So the giant mushroom. Yeah, well, it does look like a mushroom. We're gonna make some sort of electricity salad. <laughs> All right, head on up onto that platform right oh, okay. there. And I need you to put one hand on that silver ball, yes. So the way it Nothing works. Nothing is happening. <laughs> Patience. Okay. Once I turn it on, when I engage it, this is going to steal your negative charge. So it's gonna steal your Ooh. electrons. So if it steals electrons, you're gonna be positively charged. So it'll make me more positive. Even more positive. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! I am positive! Here we go. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> this machine is called a Van de Graaff generator, and it pulls the negative charge away from the person touching Whoa. it. <laughs> That is great! Instead of having equal amounts of positive and negative charges, you become positively charged. Woohoo! Science hair! Yeah! Like when you try to put two positive ends of magnets next to each other, each hair on your head starts to repel the others and be repelled from your head. Science hair! Dude! <laughs> so your hair stands up. Uh, yes. Woohoo! I can't see anything. So this is more of a machine to generate hair standing up, but it doesn't make lightning. Oh, well actually, I have a demonstration in my back pocket. This is gonna help us okay. to create lightning. This is our grounding rod. <laughs> it is my scepter of science. <laughs> and so we're gonna use this to continuously provide that negative charge. That's why static. it's plugged in. That's why it's plugged into the ground, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then if you 
touch it to that metal ball. Got it. Uh, not too exciting, right? So pull away and let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Very good. The Van de Graaff creates a positive charge. The rod has a neutral charge. When the difference becomes big enough, the charge jumps the gap. Behold, I have the power of lightning! <laughs> so it's the difference between the positive and the negative is what we want when we want to make a lightning bolt. Yes. So is there something we can use to make that happen? Large difference of charge? Yeah, I think I have just the thing. Oh yeah? Yeah, you want to check it out? Absolutely. All right, Okay, let's, let's go. It. So, you would like to move electricity from here to there. Well, what you need, my friend, is a conductor. All right, a little more arpeggio this time. No, not that kind of conductor. All aboard! No, not that kind of conductor either. This kind of conductor. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that's just a piece of metal. Well, that's right. That's because you're smart. This is a circuit. Electricity flows from this battery along the wires and into the light bulb. But Sal, you cleverly observe, the light bulb is not lit. This is true. That is because we have a gap in the circuit. And air is not a good conductor of electricity. Is metal a good conductor of electricity? Let us find out. <laughs> metal is a good conductor of electricity. What about wood? Nope. What about this horseshoe? Is a good conductor. Will this sandwich conduct electricity? Nope. No. What about this plastic fish? Nope. What about this pickle? No. Pickle is not a good conductor. That's why we make electrical wires out of copper and not pickles. <laughs> you know, in case you were wondering. Lightning bolts make interesting patterns. That's because the electricity is searching for a way to get from one side to the other. But it's hard to see the patterns of lightning bolts because they happen so fast. Fortunately, using the power of science, we can observe these patterns for ourselves in a motion we can perceive. I'm going to use electricity to recreate a lightning bolt pattern. I've got two nails in a piece of wood here, and I'm going to attach electrical leads to both nails. Now, the electricity wants to go from that side to that side, but it can't. It has to go through the wood, and wood is not a very good conductor of electricity. Now, this is very dangerous. I need a special machine even to pull this off, so this is definitely not something you want to try at home. In fact, I'm going to stand way back here when I turn it on. Like water, electricity tries to find the easiest route to get from one place to another. But sometimes that involves branching out until the right connection is made. Lightning bolts do the same thing when they branch out between the clouds and the ground. Finally, there's a spot where the branches meet and the circuit completes itself. Then the electricity follows this one path, ignoring all the others. And there you go. We just watched a lightning bolt happen in slow motion. <laughs> Science. Back to our main experiment, where Heather and I are on a quest to use static electricity to recreate a lightning bolt. Our experiments with the Van de Graaff generator had some hair-raising results, but Heather has another experiment she wants to show me. This is Jacob's ladder. Oh, so this is another way to make lightning. Yes, lightning. See, yes. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Where do, how do we get it to go? All right. So we want to turn it on. Behold! Oh, turn it on. Not, okay. Not. Go. Oh. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> you can actually see that light climbing up between the two copper wires. That's why you call it Jacob's Ladder, because it's got the rungs of the ladder. Yeah. Between these two points, there's a really great charge difference, right? OK, so what's the difference? 10,000 volts, if you're looking at it. 10,000 volts. Yeah. And volts is how you measure the difference in charge. Exactly. Why does it go up? So it goes up because rather than just staying at the closest point, mm -hmm. is because we're heating up the air. Oh. 
Oh, so yeah. hot air rises. Hot air rises. And it takes the electricity with it. So if we cooled the air, it wouldn't go up? Wouldn't immediately go up, yeah. And there it goes, and it heats back up again. Yeah. That's neat. OK, so we have a Van de Graaff generator. We got a Jacob's ladder. Are there any other devices that make lightning like this? Ooh, yeah. There's other things like the uh, Tesla coil. Really hey, high. I have a Tesla coil. You have a Tesla coil? I do. I've got one at the lab. I've just never known how to hook it up. Oh, I can help with that. Yeah. Really? Yes. OK, let's do it. Great. Let's go back to the lab. All right. Um, well, should, should, yeah, no, yeah. I'll turn that off. OK. Yeah, safety first. OK. By now, you're probably an expert on what happens when you rub a balloon on your head, right? The balloon becomes negatively charged, which means it will attract anything of an opposite charge, or anything positive, or anything that is neutrally charged, like, um, well, like me. Look at the hairs on my arm when I bring the balloon close. Whoa! You see, the neutral charge in my body is being attracted to the negative charge in the balloon. So if something is negatively charged, what happens if you bring something else negatively charged nearby? Well, they'll repel each other. And here's an experiment you can do to make something fly using static electricity. You'll need a balloon, a sweater, scissors, and a plastic bag out of the thinnest plastic you can find. Fold the bag up and cut off the bottom. You don't want that part. Then cut another strip from the bag. This will give you a hoop of plastic. I find it works better if you break it and tie it again. Lie it flat and rub it with the sweater. This will give it a negative charge. You'll know you've got enough of a charge when it really wants to stick to the table. Then take your balloon and rub the sweater on the balloon to charge it up. Because both the balloon and the hoop have negative charges, they repel each other. Then put them together and it will repel. And you can get the hoop to levitate. Ha-ha, a floating bag oh, of static charge. But here's the thing. You need to keep it away from your body. Because if you get close, the bag will stick to you. Because you're neutrally charged, and the bag is negatively charged. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. Ah, <laughs> Maxed out floating static ring. Ha-ha! <laughs> Whoa! No. Uh, yeah! Look out! Look out! Oh, no! Oh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, well. It was... It was fun while it lasted. <sighs> I gotta charge these up again. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Bika, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Buster Bika, and welcome to Cooking with Science. Let's say, for example, I've spilled the salt. Oh, no, look at me. I've spilled the salt. Oh, there's salt all over the place. Not really a big deal, right? All you have to do is clean up the salt, put it back in the container. But, oh no, I've also spilled pepper on the salt. But that's all right. You might be able to carefully separate the set. But no! Oh dear, look, the pepper and the salt are all mixed together. What do I do? Well, here's how you can save the day using the power of science. All you need is a cloth and a plastic spoon. Like, like this one here. Just rub the plastic spoon on a cloth and you'll be charging it up with a negative charge of static electricity. If it's got a negative charge, it will attract anything that has a neutral charge, just like the salt and pepper. But I know what you're thinking. How will we separate them? Well, here's the answer, my friends. Pepper is lighter than salt. Observe. Well, if you hold the spoon high enough, the pepper will be attracted and make the jump up to the bottom of the spoon, but not the salt, as long as you've got it high enough up. Because the salt is heavier, you'd have to bring the spoon closer, which we're not going to do. And if you tap it off to the side, you'll make a nice little pile of pepper, and there you go, separating the pepper from salt using the power of science. Thanks for watching Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Heather and I have been on a quest to recreate lightning using static electricity. 
We've gone from balloons to a bandograph to a Jacob's Ladder, each more lightning-y than the last. Finally, Heather suggests we use a... Tesla coil. Oh, is this named after Nikola Tesla? Yeah, he invented it. Oh, one of the founding fathers of electricity, right? right I love on. Nikola Tesla, he's cool. <laughs> so how does it work? So the way this works is it is a step-up transformer, okay. meaning we take a lower voltage and bring it up and ramp it up to a much higher voltage. Okay, so normal voltage is 120 volts. That's what we have a normal plug-in Typically, socket. we're getting it out of, yeah, exactly. And we're gonna ramp that up to really high amounts upwards of 25,000, maybe even 250,000. Wow. Volts. That's a lot. And, and that all that charge buildup, we're gonna see something pretty amazing happen. Okay. You wanna see it? Yes, um, we stand back there, right? Yeah. Let's check it out. And... The Tesla coil builds up a charge which jumps through the air to this neutral rod. Just like a lightning bolt. We made a lightning bolt! <laughs> that totally jumped a long way. That was impressive. That was a really good one. So can you control it? Yeah. OK, show me. Let's see. All right. I'm going to lower my frequency. OK. Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's like a scattered lightning bolt. Oh, wait a minute. So you can play different notes? Play different notes. Hold, I need five minutes. Hold on. Okay. Okay. All I need is five minutes. You know, I was thinking is if you can make different, hold that for a second. If you can make different frequencies, that means you can make different notes, right? Right. So, oh, I don't need that either. Hold on. Ah, that's not what I need. Okay, one more thing. Can I get that hammer? Yeah. Okay, ready to go. So what is this? When you told me the Tesla coil could play different frequencies, I thought we could make different notes come out of the Tesla coil. So I programmed it to play the notes of the Science Max theme song. What? Yeah. You want to hear? Yeah. Let's try it. Yeah! Science Max, experiments at large, lightning bolts. We need lightning. We have Woo! created lightning. Woohoo! Lightning dance. 